Hello, and welcome to Survivor Reborn's podcast series. I'm your host, Jenny Millward, and I'm joined by AJ and Chris from the Survivor Reborn team. Hey, Jen. Hey, Jen. Our very special guest, Murty Schofield, returns today for part two of an exclusive behind-the-scenes discussion of the Angel of Darkness. Thanks very much for your time, Murty. Hi there, Jenny. Today, we're going to be continuing our Angel of Darkness podcast special by delving a little more into the background of the material that wasn't included in the final game and has lain dormant in the mists of time. <laughs> so, mm. absolutely well, I thrilling. Can't, I, I can't <laughs> wait to hear. Wow, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so, AJ, I believe you have some interesting questions for Mercy. Oh yes, and he's gonna be worse than he didn't, you know, want to do that. But here we go. <laughs> yeah, make make sure Let's make sure this. they are interesting questions, though. I I don't want to be dealing with ordinary <laughs> questions. This is me. It can't be ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> hit hit me. All right. So for the tenth anniversary, Peter Connolly actually released a FMV from the game that didn't make it in the shaman scene with Putai. Yeah. So I wanted to know if you could give us a little general background info about the character and maybe some information regarding that cutscene. Um, I, I do have to uh, preface all of this um, with this was 18 years ago for me, uh, 15 years before the release. And um, I won't say anything that I don't know is accurate, but if I'm uncertain about something, I'll say. Um, my recall of the, the, the Putai character, um, it was clear that... Um, that Lara had spent some time in a desert environment and I just was very interested by the idea of developing a possible flashback series of ideas where she became a sort of Lara of Arabia um, and went, went looking for um, some Arabic names that she could perhaps have been called when she was taken care of by the wandering African tribe a desert tribal people and it came up with uh, El Hawa which is I believe the wind unless it means um, toilet paper in Arabic and somebody was playing a joke <laughs> but yeah but I, I you know I, t I was told it meant uh, the, the wind desert wind um, and it was basically exploring who it would have been that was looking after her at that time so I it didn't do a great many notes on on Putai but it was clear that um, she would, would have been looked after and mentored by a sort of Yoda character um, and apart from that um, suggesting some ideas for a, a possible cutscenes um, it was handed over and then I was moving on with other stuff so when I when I saw that the uh, um, the scene had actually been shot and moved on. I thought, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. That means we've got, we've got a keystone that we can go back and use to go back to Lara's time in the desert um, and just see what was happening there. Who is this Putai? So I, didn't ex I personally didn't explore Putai very much. I just knew that she was a sort of shamanistic, very powerful uh, tribal uh, leader. Um, and, and that was it. That was that was it as far as I was concerned. But clearly, some other people put some more thought into it. So um, yeah, that's about all I can really contribute about that. That's interesting, and especially like with the the idea that she could have been used as a sort of constant source of flashbacks. Yes. Um, I mean, tying into gameplay, I think if if I'm mistaken, AJ, I think you probably know more about this than I do. Lara had an amulet that was connected to a uh, to Putai somehow. Okay, uh, yeah, Chris is correct. There was originally an amulet. Um, it's actually good he brings this up because so it's going to bring me into my next question. But there was an amulet that apparently would basically improve Laura's strength over time. And it was her connection to Putai. Uh, when I spoke to Richard Morton, he actually gave me the information that there was originally going to be a training level. And you would use the amulet to basically upgrade Lara. Oh, yes, I remember that now. Yes, yes. I didn't have anything to do with that. I remember that being being muted, yeah. And an also interesting thing to note was he said that a false information going around that, you know, Putai would, like, see through the eyes of cats to watch over Laura as you're adventuring, but it was actually the crows, like in the Paris back streets. Right. That's actually why the crows are there. It was, the, it was supposed to be the shaman watching right. over her as she was going through this. Because right. that's a nice that ties in nicely with the crowd of crows that Putai sort of becomes in the end of the cutscene that was leaked. Right. Or, well, leaked. It was it was given out, I think, by <laughs> Peter Connolly quite deliberately. But uh, at least somebody threw us a bone. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, nice idea. So yeah, the uh, amulet, obviously going into that, uh, do you know like anything that would have to do with the early versions of Paris? Because that area went through a lot of different story changes. Oh gosh, that's a length of piece of string a question really. Yeah, there was there were yeah, there were a lot of um locations muted for Paris. Um I don't have them to hand, but I've got a whole flow chart of possible venues. Um they used to do diagrams so I could keep it clear in my own head. Um I apart from the one I was always surprised with the um the the uh, the episode in the railway carriage that that I didn't I didn't come up with that you know a lot a lot of people were putting in ideas for different locations in Paris um, and all I wanted to do at that stage because I was pushing on with Prague and and various other things just to keep an eye on it and make sure that um, whatever was coming up was gameplay and wasn't going to uh, derail the story and change the story um so there were a lot of, there were a lot of locations in paris that were that were brought up as possibilities um and the, the major ones i wanted to make sure that were nailed down were uh, what turned into the cafe where we first got a glimpse of curtis um and um and of course uh, is it ren the uh, the the shop uh, oh, the pawnbroker the pawnbroker yeah yes. yeah Yes. Yeah. Uh, you needed needed that one for for um, arming up and also finding out some more information and also bumping into shapeshifter a couple of times. I, I thought that was quite important. We bump into mysterious characters at whatever locations we were at, so that it could prefigure the fact that you you, you get to hear that uh, shapeshifter says I was there all the time and I was actually steering you and you go back to the the cut scenes and you look you say oh yeah right that was when that yeah at that location she bumped into that character so that was my kind of overview spread that i was keeping uh, keeping track of that's really cool as well with that the the idea of the shapeshifter because like in films when you realize something at the end there's a huge twist and it encourages you to go back and watch or in terms of the game it encourages you to go back and replay the game and with the better knowledge and then realize as you're playing oh my god that's that person that's that person they were always isn't there. that great isn't that great stuff when that happens it. yeah Brilliant. and what's really nice is if you actually spot it and you get a suspicion they say why is that there and you, you sort of hold that in the back of your mind when you go back and it gets the payoff you feel really smug because you've actually <laughs> you've actually <laughs> anticipated that yeah oh that was there as a key that was a sort of prefiguring little moment there and i spotted it aren't i good but it does it, as, as I said in the previous interview, it allows people to gain ownership of the game because they're actually participating creatively and realizing that they're completing some of the, the gaps that are left. And, and you know, being I'm mean, being facetious, saying smug and so on, it, it is actually a re I love that when I watch a film and I, I sort of think, oh, that's going to be significant. And either it is or it isn't. But if it is, I feel really like I've participated in the story level there. Are you wonder, you're wondering whether or not it's a Chekhov's rifle or a red herring? Yes. <laughs> and you're constantly guessing about that, yes. but you feel that you are participating actively in figuring out where the yes. story is going rather than just letting it wash over. Yeah, you yeah you're really actively participating, and I think that's very important. Uh, apart from anything else, uh, when I'm watching things, I'm coming up with all sorts of alternative ideas, you know, whatever it is, films or, or uh, comics or whatever. Um, and very often... Um, it's, it's nice to be outdone by the people who've actually written uh, the, the comic or, or made the film because some of the things I come up with, uh, I always feel are better. Oh. <laughs> you know, well, like... AJ is, is right to point out that Paris was full of all these little bits and pieces and characters that we um, wouldn't come across until much, yeah. much later in the game. And so the payoff to, to think, who is that? Yeah. What were they doing? Was, was very yeah. involving. Right. Yeah. I mean, there was an in, there was an entire section actually deleted. I don't know if Murdy actually had any hand in with this, but originally the first level of Paris, uh, Laura was on the run, and if you actually got caught, you actually had to escape a police precinct. Oh yes, yes, I remember that. I remember that being being uh, posited as a yeah a venue. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any info on that you could give us? Uh, no, no, that was it. I mean, you've you've just summed it up. That's about the sum total of my my uh, my understanding of that. It was yeah, she was going to get caught. Um, and then taken off to the precinct and had to spring herself or get sprung by somebody, possibly shapeshifter. Oh. Mm. 
that would have been an interesting yeah. twist. Yeah, and I and I into. loved the um, I loved the idea that when she runs into the assassin because I I'd um, I'd. Uh, sketched down a, quite a, a lot of background about that assassin. I mean, I don't like to think anybody just walking in and and you know he's not he or she has not come from anywhere. So um, I was sort of sketching down ideas for right, who is this assassin? Is he going to be one of the uh, one of the special characters who has got a lot of prefiguring history, or does he does he come back, or is he a set of twins, or you know all that kind of stuff? So just mm. yeah, just play with the ideas. But I thought the assassin was great. So uh, yeah. It always made me laugh that the, uh, I think the character name for that assassin was The Cleaner. Yes! <laughs> look, mess, look, look, mess on. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that's very yeah. dry. I love like it. It's that. quite a few films reference a cleaner in, in that context. That was a real hallmark of the Angel of Darkness story that it references and picks up on so many pop culture genre references you 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 threw in stuff from comics stuff from film stuff ac across yeah. genres as well you know science fiction and mystery and gothic noir and so on i mean we mentioned in the last episode that there was quite a strong lovecraftian influence oh in yes there. um yes. but that that sort of brings me to another question that i wanted to ask sort of following on from the putai really another character that was sort of dropped at the last minute was luther ruzik the sixth yes. member of the cabal. Is there anything that you can sort of tell us about him? Oh. <laughs> All right, okay. Maybe, maybe I'll revise that. What could you tell us about here that isn't that is suitable for like a PG thirteen audience? <laughs> you know, we're not we're not going into Clive Parker. He is. He was. He was one of my favourite characters, and the fact he never even <laughs> did much than pop his head above the, par the the parapet was a real, a real sadness for me. No, he he was so complex and involved. Um, you know, he was the archivist. He had all this. Um, he looked after the the Cabal records and the Cabal Hall of Trophies, and he had these wax works, which may or may not have been real wax works, or they may have been victims. You know, it was just so dark oh, and deep and goodness. grotesque. And he, and he was also, uh, he was the archivist illusionist, so he was a master of disguise. And I was playing around at one point with the fact that he might have also been a shapeshifter, but I, I dumped that. I thought we only need, we can only have one Nephilim shapeshifter in this. But I was playing around with the idea that possibly he could be a shapeshifter um but I, yeah I, I say i dumped that one um and he's wow. just he's just so dark just so dark i said some of the, some of the early concept art had him you know with these sort of nephilim tattoos on his palms similar to yes. corral um yes. but in the sort of the, the final final version of him which we never saw in game he his his appearance was far more yes. humanized yes. i think is probably yeah he the was, best he was, word for it i think he had like his face ripped open or something yeah. and he was all scarred yeah. or yeah no he was he was a, he was a real patchwork character and uh, yeah literally i mean physically he was patchwork as was boaz you know constantly experimenting on herself as in with the vivisection and, and so they were all they were all looking all of the cabal were all looking for ways to achieve a form of immortality and they were trying it in their own ways the um muller was doing it through botanical research boaz was doing it through vivisection um dread to think what uh what Ruzik was doing it through, but he had a he, he had a lot of he had a lot of unwilling victims to experiment on. So yeah, that's that's what they were all in it for. So what? Tell us a bit more about the role in the story that uh, Luther would have, have played, or if he, he, you know his his major role wouldn't have come until maybe parts two or three. That's right. That's right. He he was lined up for that, and in part uh, in game two, um, he and Gunderson are the only supposedly the only surviving members of the original Cabal, and uh, and of course Carell is is in the second game. He's posing as Eckhart. Uh, he's shapeshifted yes, to Eckhart. Yeah, he, yeah, he's he has become uh, Eckhart, and he's reforming the Cabal using Ruzik and, and Gunderson. And Ruzik and Gunderson, Gunderson, he had a lot of possibilities, but not as many as somebody as somebody like Ruzik, who had so much darkness. He was much more Lovecraftian, whereas whereas Gunderson was much more like um, Spectre or um, uh, you know the the Avengers, something like you know he was an enforcer basically. So Ruzik would have been involved in persuading people. He was a master. He would be a master of propaganda and illusion. Uh, actually, an illusionist. You know, he could he could. 
hypnosis is such a weak word for what he could do, but he could actually enforce people to con to follow his will. He could, um, you know, enforce his will on people. And yes, he would have a lot to do with another character that I wanted to, um, I keep mentioning Morgau, but he, he had a lot to do with bringing her around to the cabal side. Um, so he, he was a um, yeah, manipula master manipulator, and but very, very dark and very sick person. So I loved him. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, before we, uh, you know, move on from the Paris section, uh, there was actually rumors going around that there was also going to be a scrapyard level where Lara would go from Ren, Ren's pawn shop. When you're escaping yeah. from there, yeah. she would go onto the boat and then she would go from the boat to the scrapyard before going to the Louvre. Yes, yeah, so I remember. I remember that as a part of a discussion. Um, th there were a lot of very good ideas being thrown in, and because you know it, we had to streamline the whole thing. So, but I, I don't know. I can't remember much about that. Yeah, she was going to catch a boat down the down the uh, down the river and and uh, and turn up at the Louvre. So yeah, the fans have kind of dissected that part of the game with the uh, Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness PC program. You can make Lara fly against you know triggers and everything and get yeah. around the environments. The boat is actually there. And there's water you can swim in. It's all solid. Is it? Is it? Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning stuff here. This is a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Murray. The fans dissected this game completely. I there's, know. Uh, I know. I there's was... actually a section. <laughs> there's a section where you're in uh, Margot Carvier's apartment, and you have to escape from the police. Yeah. yeah. If you actually skip the trigger and fly outwards. Yeah. You arrive at the very beginning section where Lara wakes up in the uh, old train section. Yeah, but it's at night. Ah, all right. I was I was saying this to Chris and and Jenny the um, the other day that you know it's, it, it, this is always going to happen. There will be people out there who know a hell of a lot more of what was going on because at the time. Um, uh, you know, my, my my task was to keep the story moving, do the dialogue, choose people to do the characters, and so on. So apart from ideas being thrown in by lots of people, um, I wasn't able to keep an eye on everything. I mean, and there was no reason I should. You know, it was a team effort. Mm -hmm. Every, everybody was everybody was doing a wonderful job keeping an eye on how it was going. But when the cut started, that was when I I felt under pressure um, and had to make sure that the story kept some kind of sense of coherence. Um, and so things like the boat trip and quite a few other things, I guess, uh, would have been first for the clip, um, uh, you know, in order to move the whole thing on. Well, it's very much like a film edit in that, re in yeah. that regard. You know, what yeah. scenes and shots can you afford to drop yeah. and still keep a coherent plot going? Yeah, it's not an unusual process. It's the same with writing novels as well. You know, you, you'd like to go and spend time in a cottage with somebody boiling a cup of tea. While this, meanwhile, your, your heroine is chasing across the landscape, being pursued by monsters. And you, where, would the, where would the audience rather be? OK, let's go with the monsters. <laughs> you know, just get on with it, yeah. move it along. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff cut from the Paris sections. Um, I don't know if Murdy knows, but people actually found the unused audio assets that didn't get yes. used. Uh, like yes, we did. There is a newspaper person you could actually walk up to. There was originally going to be a hotel that Janice would have stood in or stood in front of. Yay, Janice. Yeah, yeah, for Janice. Yeah, where she comes Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Your friendly neighborhood prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, Murdy needs to hear that song. <laughs> he does. He really does. You know, the one, one, of, one of the truths I've never shared with anybody. So here's here's um, here's a world exclusive. Paris. There wasn't anybody living in Paris. It was all the shapeshifter. Um, he was. Oh. He, okay. <laughs> the the shapeshifter was everybody. <laughs> killed everyone well that explains that mod we saw on youtube where they uh swapped out curtis for carvier <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it great it's great when people do stuff like that it's, ha it's just having fun with the whole thing yeah brilliant Crouched across the river, smoking a cigarette, and then smiling and walking off yep. enigmatically when Lara reaches for yeah, that explosion. On, on, <laughs> yeah, and that, I was just going to say, as you pull back from Curtis after he's flicked the cigarette, you realise he's got stilettos on. He hasn't completely. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question that I know a lot of people want to know if you have any information on. Um, originally, in like promotional videos and stuff, Lara actually had her twin pistols. Uh, according to Richard Morton, when I talked to him, uh, the early version of the game had Lara pick up a second dual pistol, but he couldn't 
you know, remember which part of the story it happened. Do you have any foggy idea of that? No, I, I know the, I know we were playing around with the idea of twinning her up with the pistols, but um, no, I, I couldn't, I couldn't speak about that really. Um, that was outside of my re remit, you know. Um, I mean, basically, that would be to do with an animation thing and, um, yeah, the whole whole range of stuff. So I, I knew that discussion was on. Are we going to go back to the Twin Pistols? Um, and, and and the backpack, of course, which uh, you know, got dumped pretty quickly. So, yeah. yeah. Her poor backpack got eaten by dogs. Yeah. I mean, it is kind of funny when you're playing the game and random cutscenes will go from having one pistol to two pistols magically. <laughs> Yeah. Or yeah. her sunglasses will match. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the sunglasses. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad she kept the ponytail at least. So that was something. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so going from the twin pistols, obviously there was another area that was actually scrapped from the game. Uh Castle Kriegler. Oh yes. Yes. So yeah. if you can just give us a rundown, any information you can on that. Uh, there was a lot of stuff um, sketched in to happen there, an awful lot of stuff. There was going to be a Lux Veritatis bloodline room, which Curtis would have to get to. Um, um, for various mysterious Lux Veritatis ceremonies and re-empowerment and, and so on. There was an awful lot of stuff going to be going on there, um, including, uh, well, the whole thing that... The, one of the very first establishing pieces I ever wrote was uh, an FMV, which was in 1945. It was the, the bombers coming over Castle Kriegler, and the whole scene took place within the castle. It was the guardians who were looking after the... Uh, the entrapment equipment that was keeping Eckhart in check. Uh, we, we had a flash up to the um, the aircraft that were coming in. It was the Allied aircraft, and nobody quite knew that why they were being redirected to bomb this castle and, and so on. So it was a whole FMV. Oh, wow. It was a whole it was a whole dialogue section. Then there were dialogue between the guardians and and various other people going on, and who actually stayed and who escaped. And of course, one of the people who escaped was not one of the guardians, but it was the servant of one of the guardians, which was a character called Heisterm. Um And he escaped, and he was given the um, the uh, the periap shard to to take away to safekeeping. And of course, that was Curtis's grandfather, uh, and that was all established in that scene. That's fantastic. But, but that would have made a, a great FMB. But again, time, money uh, just wouldn't have happened. And I know um, all of this stuff, I think that may be on um, on Ash's Tomb of Ash somewhere. Well, it's it's the, the screenplay, yeah. if you like, the for, for the FMB rather than the FMB itself, unfortunately. But... Oh, nothing was ever shot. Yeah. Hey, somebody out there who loves animation might actually... Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, that was... I was just going to say, was any of it actually recorded? Like uh, no, voice wise no, or anything no, like that? No, we never recorded no. that. Just concept. No, it was just, for me, it was like, it was what I call my mood piece. It established the sense and feeling of what I was trying to create and communicate with the rest of the team. And when I gave them that to read and looked at it and I talked them through it and they said, oh, right, yeah, that's great. That's good. So it was, it was marked up for actually being shot. But when we started to look, you know, we got further down the line and people were going to go and do shoot the FMVs in Paris and all the rest of it. That one, it was just, well, we just actually we don't need that. We can we can we can dump that one. And that one was dumped. But it was written up in full. Uh, and, you know, as you say, Jen, if someone was to take that and turn that into the FMV, Mike, I would love to see that. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Same, same. I, I would adore to sort of get a flavour of what was going on in that that time period because, of course, in the Angel of Darkness, we don't actually have any information about um, where Eckhart had sort of come from. I mean, Lara picks up a few diaries and fragments here and there, like yeah. in Hornkrow's apartment, where you know she gets fragments about oh, the Black Alchemist was imprisoned in 1345 or whatever it was, but we don't know how and what happened to him during those periods of time. So Eckhart is a big mystery, really. It's these little side yeah. stories. Yeah. It's really yeah. exciting. This is, what, this is what I love about dark histories or shadow histories or hidden histories. It, to serve the story, you just need a statement like Eckhart was imprisoned for so long in this place, but he was sprung at the end of 1945, you know, by an Allied bombing raid. Um, that's all you need to serve the story. But when you look at that and look at the iceberg that's beneath that there's an entire history that's been written 
about all that and what Eckhart was doing and why he went to um, Anatolia and Cappadocia and what he came back with. He set up the breeding communities. All of that, you know, it's like that never came into any of the game, but it's there. And that sort of leads beautifully into the next question about cut content, you know, moving on from Castle Kriegler. Oh, can I just say one one more thing about uh, it for you, AJ? There's, there's, um, I did do a, uh, it was a sort of diagrammatic chart of Castle Kriegler um, uh, on, a, on, I think it was on graph paper. And I think Ash may have that as well. And it shows some of the ideas, the initial ideas of what happened when Curtis and Lara get to Castle mm. Kriegler. There's, there's a, a various, they've, they've got to fight their way through a forest to get to the base of the castle. They've got to, and, and so on. I can't remember the exact detail. I don't have it to hand, but it is there. And that was, that was like the initial idea of what was going to be happening at Castle Kriegler. Um, <laughs> my God, we could have an entire game dedicated just to Castle Kriegler. I want it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it sounds like, you know, Castle Kriegler was just full of so much potential yeah. and was never really, you know, fully explored. As, you know, AJ suggested before that it could be an entire game all by itself. Mm -hmm. I think so. There were, yeah, because, uh, yes, a lot of the stuff that was put into Prague uh, was going to happen at Castle Kriegler and Cappadocia. Um, so, you know, they're all amalgamated into 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 Prague in the end, but Kriegler was a great location. There's so much stuff going on there. And, of course, it was going back to the original site of where, where um, Eckhart had been in prison. So there was, there'd be all that um, um, Lux Veritatis masonry and, and mecha mechanisms for keeping him contained. There'd be the, you know, the pit of pain where he was imprisoned and chained. All that stuff, I mean, it's fabulous. Cinematically. So much potential. Cinematically, it's just, you know, it's eye-popping, yeah. See, Angel of Darkness would work very well with today's... Uh downloadable content style yeah they could oh, honestly yes. oh, remake yeah. it release it in paris section cappadocia uh turkey yeah mm, like a sort of episodic game yeah. yeah i mean i don't know why they're not doing that it's such a wasted amount of potential because there's a lot of young people out there they're all they've all got their own ideas and they want to do them and i think they should and you know they're creating the new game they haven't got time to look back and i think it's up to people who've got the time and, and the passion to do that if, if fans want to go back and look at those and take that material and, and work it into something good luck to them i mean that would be fantastic to see absolutely well, this is something that was a very big part of the Angel of Darkness at, at the time. I mean, it came out in 2003. It was so ahead of its time in so many ways. Absolutely. I mean, the, the ambition of it, yeah, ultimately might have been part of the reason for its, its, its struggle. But my Even God. Even by today's the, standards, it's oh, up there. Yeah, it really is. You know, far too many people still overlook it in terms of, oh, well, I couldn't master the controls or I, I've just got, you know, I didn't get past first level because I couldn't uh, master the keyboard or anything. Well, look beyond that and just have a little patience. And my God, it stands so far and so ahead of so many games. Yeah, it's, it's ironic it's too. Ambitions. It's ironic too because games that are coming out now are using elements of Angel of Darkness that were panned back then. So it's kind of like Angel of Darkness almost lit the way for these games. In, in all fairness, you know, if somebody's bought a game and uh you know all this excitement's going on all the, all the publicity's going on you get down and you can't play the damn thing because of the controls a lot of people are not going to spend the time looking behind the scenes to see what was going on and i can completely empathize with that but what's been lovely what's been absolutely affirming and wonderful for me is that people ha did get caught by it they were intrigued by the things that were dropped in as clues and they've, they've bothered to go back and dig into it and that's why you know, that's why I'm, I'm answering questions like this now, um, uh, you know, 15 years later, because people did go back and pay it attention, which is fantastic. Very much so. You know, that actually makes me wonder too, Murdy, if you ever, ever actually approach to make like a sequel to Angel of Darkness in like novel format, would that be something, or even a CGI uh -huh. film? to be brought on for a writer I, for that. I would, I would very much like to be part of a team that was doing that. I wouldn't like to hold sole responsibility anymore. Um, I've, I've, put a, I've put most, not all, I've put most of my ideas that I had for games two and three out there. They're, they're out there. Most of the stuff I wanted to do is out there. Now, if, so, if some team wanted to get together and work with me on bringing that into some kind of coherence, I'd be very interested in doing it. But... Uh, 
at this stage in my, I'm not the person I was 15 years ago. And although I've got a passion for Angel of Darkness still, um, I wouldn't want to go back and start working on it solo. I would be very interested in doing it as part of a team. That leads me to a, if you were brought onto the Tomb Raider team today, what sort of ideas would you bring to the table? Like what is really sort of firing you up at the moment? What sort of story would you bring? What sort of mythology? Would it be a similar one to Angel of Darkness? Would it be something completely oh, different? I'd like to pick up the themes of the, the, the bloodline and the where where it is that people like Lara and Curtis and all these other people have come from. What is it that makes them stand out from the normal mass of humanity? And I'd like to explore the background that goes into a bloodline that can produce people who can not have superpowers, but can have incredible latent uh, abilities if, that if given the right training and the right environment, and, and the right uh, mentoring, they can become these incredible people. Again, not, not superpowers, just ordinary human powers enhanced to the point of being 100% realized. That, that, would, that would really intrigue me. And to see Lara do that, I mean, it would, it would derail Lara into a completely different approach and time, timeline and, and universe. Uh, but she'd be going alongside with Curtis and, you know, Morgau and anybody, you know, kind of characters that I could come up with or already have and haven't done much with and, and characters that other people could come up with as well. You know, I'm, I'm going to say I don't I wouldn't want to do this solo. I've had enough of writing, you know, 10, 12 hours a day solo and I'm wondering whether it's going anywhere. Is anybody going to, you know, knock on the door and say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, I, I'd love to I'd love to do that. So yeah, that bloodline exploration would would be foremost in in my mind at the moment, and it and it would link back, of course, to the idea. Have you heard of a book called From the Ashes of Angels by Andrew Collins? I have a little confession, Murty. I was going to say after the interview last week, uh, last week when we were talking about how Angel of Darkness inspires people to go and do their own research, Angel of Darkness for a good few years made me utterly obsessed with the concept of Nephilim and I read and researched every <laughs> single thing I could get my hands on and From the Ashes of Angels was one of my favourite go-to books on the subject I, it's absolutely fascinating isn't it an absolutely superb piece of work you know, and, and, and you don't have to believe it, you don't have to disbelieve it, you don't have to criticise it, attack yes. it just read it for what it is it's, it's absolutely brilliant yeah, and why, why, somebody, ha why somebody hasn't taken that up and and made it into yeah, a, a really mini series or some the ideas behind that you'd have to have a story there isn't a story there but um something like say i don't know angel of darkness for example um you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah somebody really ought to make a playable game about that <laughs> Oh, it's great! It's great, great to hear you say that, Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, from the ashes of angels was uh, yeah. Well, a question I have to end this with is, you know, how does it make you feel that almost fifteen years later, you know, something that was critically panned basically by the press, has still having the fans, the hardcore fans, going back to this game fifteen years later and still appreciate and digging up everything they can. <laughs> Um, like, how does that make you feel as a writer? Very emotional, actually, at this stage. It's um, it's complete validation, and it really didn't look like it was going to happen. I poured so much of myself into that game, and I could have just done a, a work-for-hire job of keeping the story going, but I poured everything into it that I could to make it as rich as I could in the hope that people would pick up on it and say, oh, wow, this, you know, this is really interesting and i've said this many times in public and in interviews but just just to round it off you know i was so crippled by the end result after angel of darkness was released because i knew that everybody's efforts and everybody was doing the best they could uh, you know rich morton was fantastic to work with jamie uh, james kenny you know so many great people in that and just just have it the whole thing, have the franchise taken away from the company. It was crippling. And I, I, I didn't, I just went selectively numb and anesthetized myself against everything to do with Tomb Raider for about three years. And it was only through the persistence of people just respectfully just trying to make contact that I, I sort of came out of that. Um, and now, you know, I've, I've been to conventions, I've had people coming up to me and telling me what it meant to them and what it meant to their creativity and their lives. 
wonderfully validating. It's very, very affirming. And, um, you know, if it's worth having been born. It's good. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for it. Yeah, we, we just as fans could not put into words how much it's meant to us as, as creators and as Tomb Raider fans. It's it's something truly special. It's truly brought people special. together. Oh, I could sum it up quite nicely. Thank you. I hope people go on having fun with it for many years to come, making their own stories and digging into it. And, you know, all my good wishes go with them. Well, I don't know if you heard, Murdy, but the fans have actually took it upon themselves to fix the controls for the PC version. It's actually running really good now on PC. I, I did hear that. Yes, I did hear that. But as I don't play games, um, you know, that doesn't... <laughs> It doesn't impinge on my my. Sh well, for me, I just I'm just hoping it brings more people back to actually want to go back and experience it how it was supposed to be played. Now that would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be fun. I, I think it deserved a better airing than it got, um, and it certainly seems to be getting that now. So you know, happy completion. That's a, that's a good end to the story or a continuation of the story. Yeah, <clears throat> very much so. Well, thank you ever so much for coming on today, Murti. It's been a real privilege to hear you talk about your inspiration and some of the things that we as fans didn't really get to see in the final product. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. If you've enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you hit the bell icon so you never miss a new episode. Also, check out our social media feeds. All the links are in the description. Happy raiding. <laughs>